China, 1946. Resuming conflicts following the end of the Second World War, China was no longer united against the common threat of Japan. The coast had been saturated with fire and gunshot, whole cities remained bones of what they once were, but peace was still far over the horizon. Now absent of a common enemy, the Chinese nationalists resumed their civil war against the Chinese communists, a dispute which began nearly two decades earlier, in 1927. The first half of the war, which took place prior to the Second Sino-Japanese War, had favored the nationalists and concluded in a communist retreat, which became known as the Long March. The nationalists became the de facto government, but almost just as quickly, the war with Japan broke out. Post-war, the nationalists had been divided and weakened, while the communists had made a comeback, not only preserving their numbers, but growing them substantially, thanks to earned sympathy from disillusioned Chinese citizens. While the Soviets used the war to justify keeping their own troops in Chinese lands, formerly occupied by the Japanese. Soviet troops handed over all captured Japanese weapons to the Chinese communists, giving what was a petty force of rifle-armed farmers and students the capability of a genuine military. Worse yet, nationalist defectors and POWs submitted to training the communists to properly use these weapons, turning former Japanese-occupied Manchuria into a communist stronghold. The additional hardships of the Second Sino-Japanese War led many Chinese nationals to lose faith in the government, who hadn't the opportunity to fully recover from the losses of the early civil war. This, in addition to many loyal nationalists losing their lives fighting the Japanese, helped tilt the balance in favor of the communists even further. While at first the nationalists came close to driving the communists out of Manchuria, a delay in action on account of the U.S. pressing for peace between the two gave the communists all the time needed to regroup and rout the nationalists out of the mainland, forcing them into exile in Taiwan, while mainland China fell to communism and became the People's Republic of China. The PRC was prepared to end the nationalists once and for all, however the outbreak of the Korean War led to a sudden U.S. interest in the region for the sake of containment. And so today, the situation persists of the People's Republic of China still occupying the mainland, while the nationalists in Taiwan, following the ascension of President Chiang Kai-shek's son, Chiang Ching kuo established an increasingly democratic system once it became clear this thought-brief military outpost would become a long-term arrangement. Taiwan's republic has, relatively speaking, been doing pretty well for itself, being home to a growing economy built on technological development and exportation, much like South Korea and Japan proudly sporting a high-income educated workforce that ranks highly on the global index, despite its relatively small population and geographic size. The PRC too has been doing well, however its massive workforce falls behind Taiwan's on average, likely only reaching the heights they have thanks to their enormous population, leading one to speculate how much stronger China could have been had the nationalists won the civil war. During the Communist Long March, many hardships were met along the way, and it could have been an easy matter for leaders Mao Zedong and Zhao Enlai to perish before they had the chance to turn the tables. Alternatively, the nationalists could have refused to abide by the U.S.'s call for peace and driven the communists out of Manchuria and into the USSR. These choices would leave us with slightly different outcomes, so I'll explain the immediate implications of both before we settle on which one to follow. So either in a brush with unfriendly locals or due to illness or hunger, Mao and Enlai don't live to see the end of the march, and their men are left without proper guidance. Regardless of if the communists can muster the same support they had in our timeline, their ranks are now disorganized and scattered, possibly breaking into multiple rival factions, which the nationalists could now easily pick off, even with Soviet support. At worst, needing to deal with a loose insurgency hiding out in caves in the mountains, at best eradicating their presence entirely. Most likely, some communists do survive and establish their own autonomous zones near the Soviet border, similar to how some warlords had done in China's west. These forces become occasional troublemakers and may initiate a border dispute between China and the USSR later down the line, but for most intents and purposes, the communist threat is neutralized. The region of East Turkestan, which had also stood in opposition to the nationalists, may be granted independence for the sake of ending conflict, so work on reconstruction could finally begin. The nationalists officially recognizing the people of the region as not being part of the Han Chinese nation, and thus deserving of their own land, while the Soviets had supported any opposition to the nationalists period, and may attempt to install their own friendly communist leader in Turkestan, as they had done in Mongolia. Option 2. The nationalists press onward into Manchuria, recognizing that every moment counts. Every day that the communists are not defeated, they grow stronger. After a grueling push, becoming especially intense along the Soviet-Manchurian border, the communists are finally forced to flee into outer Manchuria, a land within the USSR. Celebrations are in order as conflicts are nearly brought to a close. East Turkestan is still prepared to fight for independence, but the nationalists need to begin rebuilding or risk the rise of a new communist faction. Thus, the nationalists withdraw from the region, and the East Turkestan Republic is granted full autonomy, again likely falling under the sphere of Soviet influence. 
The escaped communists would settle down in outer Manchuria, creating a home there which could be characterized by heavy militarism and authoritarianism, though of course still being subject to the Soviet Union. This would make of outer and inner Manchuria a dynamic similar to North and South Korea, the communist outer Manchurians regularly making shows of force and asserting a desire to retake the whole of their land. The border along this region would be heavily fortified and buffered by an impassable demilitarized zone littered with mines and traps. The big difference between these two timelines is the status of the communists, either existing in their own geographic region, such as in Option 2, or taking on a more insurgent, terroristic character. For the sake of predictability, we'll be following Option 2, since it'd just be tougher to pinpoint the actions of a loose insurgency instead of a North Korea-esque Soviet territory. Post-war, the nationalists reassert total control, censoring any communist sympathizers or similar threats to peace. A great reconstruction would begin, possibly subsidized by the US as the Korean War would certainly still break out, many of the communists having fled to North Korea during the push in Manchuria and lending their arms to the efforts of the North Koreans. Kim Il-sung would have still pressed for an invasion of the South, reaching out to Stalin for support, who in this timeline plainly refuses, urging him not to take action, but Kim Il-sung disobeys, believing the South was sufficiently weakened, and the North, with their bolstered number of Chinese communist remnants, would be able to capture the land without even triggering noteworthy US intervention. But he would be wrong. As in our timeline, the threat of a fall in South Korea would compromise the US as asset of Japan, that is, what was considered their most reliable countermeasure against Soviet expansion in Asia. Though in this timeline China doesn't fall to communism, the nationalists still can't be relied upon, as while Chiang Kai-shek was willing to play ball with the US, he was also notably critical of international powers meddling in China's affairs. Thus, the US began funneling manpower and weapons into South Korea, who was indeed woefully unprepared. However, without the People's Republic of China regularly supporting the Koreans, the duration of the war is cut short. China could certainly engage in combat with the North Koreans, but in truth wouldn't need to, as we can assume a fortified border is established just as had been done with Manchuria's north, majorly locking the communists into the Korean peninsula, with only a small corridor connecting them to the again disapproving USSR. However, it would be through here that escaped communists would lend their support to the Koreans, against Stalin's wishes, mind you. North Korea's support system is nowhere near what it was in our world, spelling an eventual fall of the north to the south with North Korean leadership likely fleeing to outer Manchuria. This similar pattern would follow in the rest of Asia, specifically Indochina. Communists in Vietnam don't have the neighboring support of China and thus fall to US interventions. The Soviets, in the absence of an East Asiatic communist sphere, would likely move their focus to Central Asia, the Middle East, and Africa. The Soviets had seen the Arab nations as hotbeds for communism to arise and roads to creep ever closer into Europe. Iran's regime change may likely take a more firmly communistic character in place of China, and an early invasion of Afghanistan may be seen. Meanwhile, propagandizing in India and Africa stimulate ideological shifts, which bring these lands ever closer to communism. An early build of Soviet activity in Africa also means the US may begin to back Western colonies for the sake of halting the spread of communism, as was the arrangement with South Africa between the 70s and 90s, this relationship being doubled down upon and extending all the way up into Rhodesia to create the solid African South as a pro-Western bloc. With greater Soviet investment, the events of the Suez Crisis deal a devastating blow to Britain, France, and Israel. Once again, immediate post-Civil War China is quite accurately a dictatorship, but a necessary one to preserve order and prevent invasion from the USSR. As had been seen in Taiwan, reconstruction would run parallel to hard militarization and enforcement of both discipline and loyalty to the state in order to ensure communism not rise again though ironically utilizing many of the same tactics the Soviets had, as their head of the secret police would have studied in the Soviet Union. That man would be Chiang Kai-shek's son, and the future president of China, Chiang Ching Kuo. It would be under him that major construction and developmental projects would be launched, targeted at vastly improving China's infrastructure, as well as put a great emphasis on both production and exportation of high-quality consumer goods, i.e. electronics and chemicals, to raise the per capita income and stimulate economic growth after which he would begin peeling away the autocratic nature of China to create a more democratic system, decriminalizing rival political parties once it became evident China was restabilized and set on a course for long-term improvement. Without the rise of a communist Chinese nuclear program and the Sino-Soviet split, the Cold War, or at least fears of mutually assured destruction, may subside as Soviet-American relations improve and agreements to restrict the creation of further nuclear weapons comes to more concise decisions. China no longer becomes a dangerous rogue card, though India might take its place if weapon restrictions aren't implemented early enough. While mutually assured destruction may be averted, the rivalry between the US and USSR may linger on perhaps even past the 90s, as fewer nuclear weapons means the Soviets don't bankrupt themselves building a massive stockpile. This opens the door for more intense proxy wars in Africa, the Middle East, and even India. 
As China would come to be fairly independent and largely self-sufficient, it may later adopt a position of non-alignment along with Yugoslavia, the Arab world, and some other nations, providing them with a new source of resource production which in turn would help establish it as a producer of goods for the world over, and propel it to a high economic rank, free from the mandates and dogmas of both the West and the Communists. And that is where I'll end this video for now. The US of Z thanks you for watching, support your legion by liking the video, or join our ranks by subscribing for more. Mr. Z. Out.